when we're talking about the wealth gap, gender pay gap, ethnicity pay gap, tax bills. Do you earn more than the average? I recently did a video about how much people are paid in the UK from full-time work on my YouTube channel, and it got a lot of people talking, but I really just touched the surface. So today I wanted to go behind the data and look deeper into the issues that this brings up. People like Warren Buffett, he credits a lot of his wealth to winning the ovarian lottery. How we got here. Discrimination isn't always in individual people. Sometimes it's in the rules. And what you can do about it. When it comes to getting promotion pay rises, that's the best advice that I've received. Just before we start this one, I just want to introduce the episode because we're going to be talking about some pretty interesting topics today. Some of them that I personally don't have experience in, some of the other people around this table may have or may not. But I think it's important to caveat that we just want to have a broad discussion that, that looks at the data on averages and and where people sit with their incomes in the UK. Because without having those conversations, people don't know. And I think it's empowering to have that information. Um, so hopefully we people can take something out of this and we can also try to represent the people here that don't have a voice around this table. Like I said, we'll go through the averages and I've got the data here and then we'll just try and have a round table conversation. Today, we're joined by Timmy Merriman Johnson, who is the founder of a financial education company, Mr. Money Jar, and also a national numeracy ambassador. Thank you for joining us, mate. Yeah, thank you for having Pleasure. me. I couldn't think of a better voice in the personal finance space to have this conversation because I always think you find a way to really nail the human side of the discussion. And I've said to you that to you in personally as well. Yeah, thank you. It was really good meeting you for the first time at the event we spoke at and great to meet you too, Timmy. Cheers. We're like name twins almost. Yeah, I know, TNT. Is, it, is your name Yoruba? Yeah, nice. to me it means God is behind me. Uh, mine is God is always with me. I got no idea what mine means. Mine's <laughs> the son of the devil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is pretty appropriate. The son of the devil. pretty appropriate. Yeah. Is your dad called Lucifer by any yeah, chance? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is going to go well, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's just start, first of all, the big number. So these these figures recently came out. There's going to be new figures in a few months. So just bear that in mind when you're listening to it. Um, but these are this is based on salary or PA, uh, PAYE earnings. So the median monthly pay is £2,260. That's an increase of 6.7% compared to the same time last year. That means that average income is about £27,000 in the UK. I mean, how do you feel about that number? Yeah, obviously that's the uh, overall um, mm. stat. Like it'll, there'll be like regional variances. Oof. We know that um, in Wandsworth, for example, that figures three and a half K and then in, in Leicester. 1,900 um, Yeah, 1.9 K. So I think the overall number is important, but what's even more important than that is like what you can actually buy with your money. So we'll need to take into account people's biggest costs, like their rental mortgage, their bills, their groceries and stuff, and how much disposable income they have left over. And I think a great thing um, in the uh, video that you posted, Damien, that I think it's at a quarter of a million views yeah, now yeah. on YouTube. Yeah. And you got a comment from YouTube as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was really good. That's huge. <laughs> um, something, something you said in that video that really stayed with me is that like you could move, uh, was it 100 miles 100 or miles down the road and and actually be in like one of the cheapest parts mm. of the country and so i've thought for a long time that the uk was very london centric and i've recently moved from london to brighton um and i think it's important to think about where you can get the biggest bang for your buck and not just the buck mm. that's my that's my thought yeah it's it's spot on because how expensive is Wandsworth to live in? I don't know. If, I imagine it's not cheap to buy a house in, in Wandsworth. It's, it's quite, it's quite a, it's a nice area. Yeah, it's a well-to-do um, area. If the, if the difference between Leicester and Wandsworth is 100 miles and you're sat in Leicester right now, what's stopping those people making that move? Well, I guess you don't just live somewhere because of how much money you can earn there. There'll yeah. be like family and friends and networks and that sort of thing. And I don't have any kids, but I imagine like having a family would make that upheaval um, more difficult as well, particularly if you've got things like schools to consider and so on. What I'm hoping is that in the long term, with the um, increased appetite for working from home and stuff, and with you know the high speed rail projects and so on, that the UK is genuinely more of a connected place to live in and that you can move somewhere else, but work remotely and, and increase your wage, for example. I was definitely going to say something just like that. I mean, when I graduated from my MBA in Manchester, the best time I had was graduating, having a job that paid me a London salary, but I was living in Manchester. Mm -hmm. So my rent was so cheap compared to what it is in London. So I think working remotely, you can do that. Like you could be 
living in Leicester, or you could be living in Wandsworth, but your drug company's in Leicester, but you need to make sure that the salary is higher where you're getting paid than where you live. Yeah, so if you're earning a set amount of money every month, yeah, moving to an area of the UK that's cheaper is a way to get more bang for your buck. But then there's also three other things, I think. There's upskilling, there's promotions and pay rises, and then there's moving to a different job. Because as you also said in your video, there's like 30 million PAYE earners. So that's like almost half the country, right? So in terms of upskilling, and this is something that I wish that I'd taken more seriously when I was younger and earlier on in my career. Um, if you can pay an amount of money to learn a, a skill that leaves you better off then if you hadn't had paid that money, then that's something worth learning. And this is what Warren Buffett actually calls intrinsic value analysis. So I'll give you an example. If you do a video editing course, say, and you pay a grand to do that, that's what you call the book value of that course. That's the amount that it's cost you to do that. But if you then go on to make a thousand pounds a month, every month from video editing, that is the intrinsic value of that course that you've taken. And that will last you a lifetime. I think public speaking and learning how to code or learning a different language are also other skills that fall into this remit, which is if you can train yourself in how to do something, upskill yourself, then you can increase your earnings potential, potentially unlimited to down the line. Yeah. And you can even just step into a different sector that has a higher average pay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, be like I said in the video, be HR within finance, not within arts, because mm. finance has a higher median pay. So you'll probably be doing similar work and getting paid more for it. Yeah. One thing is with the skills. So one thing I did wrong early in my career was I was a career salesman. Mm. And I almost assumed that when I left the job, I was starting at the floor again. And I probably walked into businesses and then d accepted less than I should have got. You know, I could have gone in and gone, I've been selling for X amount of years in a different field, but it was almost like, oh, I don't know this field. So I'm on the bottom of the ladder and mm -hmm. then I just had to drag my way up again. How do people know how to value skills like that? You know, that don't come with a, a hard number on them. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I'm not sure if I'm the best person no, I can answer to, that answer, one. to answer that question. This guy just knows how to put can, price yeah. tag on Just something. because I sucked in the corporate world. I've only ever been promoted twice and the most I've ever earned is 34K like in my life. And I knew, like I'm, I run my own business now, but I just knew for the long term, like I'm not going to, I just forever, I, I worked for some good companies, had good colleagues and good managers and stuff, but I just couldn't play the game, couldn't do the politics, couldn't get promoted. So my trajectory was always going to be on earning my own money. Mm -hmm. I feel a lot safer now as an entrepreneur Interesting. Um, and as a content creator. A lot of people don't feel like that. Look, it's, it's really weird, but I, I feel a lot safer because I know that I can just you know, promote myself, sell a bit more, make a bit more money. But when I was working in the job, it was like, there's this secret code you needed to know to ask for the pay rise or like get the promotion. So it'd be interesting to hear your- Definitely. Your I mean, advice. I just say because I spent my most, my whole, most of my career in sales. So I mean, I sold everything, uh, <laughs> everything, <laughs> commodity, not everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, <laughs> Commodities. It's a com different podcast. Different yeah. podcast. <laughs> yeah. uh, the London podcast. <laughs> no, um, commodities, carbon credits, fine investment wine, like red wine to invest with, uh, car, um, cryptocurrency, mm. and now I'm in venture capital. So it's really how you see your skills and you value them, but not everyone knows how to translate that into a CV. Yeah, speaking in terms of outcomes rather than in terms of responsibilities. Exactly. Like, I looked after this team. Well, what did that team create? How much? money did they bring in so on after a few years i learned you know sales is transferable and if you've got a proven track record that's that's better than most sales people so i had like a a book of it's like a, a book of achievement remember the achievement award <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no certificates yeah, yeah i just used to print off months where it was like damien is the top biller yeah, yeah like all yeah, that stuff so when it comes to getting promotion pay rises that's the best um advice that i've received which is that if you can get your line manager the people that are in charge of you to buy into your progress you almost go over the next six to twelve months I want to go up a level. They'll know what you're talking about when you say that and what things do I need to achieve within the firm to be paid more. And then you report, you keep that kind of Damien's book of achievements and then you work towards them. So by the time you return to them, a year down the line, half year down the line, you've already done all the things and then they have no choice but to promote you. But then to the earlier point about like, you know, your company just might not have the funds. You might be in an industry which has an earning ceiling. The biggest pay jumps that I've seen when I've spoken to people in the coaching capacity 
um, or when I've spoken to former colleagues during my corporate life was when people move jobs. So yeah. You just need to be prepared to do that. That's when you're going to get the biggest jump. I really like that. Um, speaking to your boss, it's the sales line of if I, will you? You know. So then it's if they say yes, it's like, well, I've delivered that, so you've got to buy. So you know, we always used to try and get those kind of lines in, in sales conversations, but have the same conversation with your boss of like, you know, what do I need to do to move up a step? really quantify it because I think a lot of people are just passengers in businesses and mm. they might think if I work harder than everyone else I'll get promoted and then they see other people moving up the ladder and it's like why is that happening and they don't realize that businesses don't want to really promote people they just want them to work as hard as possible yeah. and it's the people who push that get moved yeah yeah and that, I just didn't know how to do that from I mean, being transparent yeah. why do you want to pay someone more if you could pay them the same exactly yeah, so it's not in their interest to give you more money you've got to fight for that money I definitely even think if you earn even if you deserve it you still need to fight for it and argue for it because I think this leads nicely into into the conversation around gender then mm -hmm. within pay you know they say money doesn't buy happiness of course I think they're lies it's dead wrong well I think it's probably a bit more nuanced than that isn't it they say it's about experiences you're experiencing sudden hair loss <laughs> you're such a savage <laughs> well this is true um, I've been using manual to kind of combat that I've been so impressed with the results I actually asked them to sponsor the podcast good man how's that how are you finding it well, I mean, how are you finding it? I think it's good. My hair looks thicker. Yeah, it looks a bit better, Tintin. It's looking thicker, more luscious, a bit like mine. If you're losing your hair and want to do something about it, like Damo, check out Manual. You can get 55% off by using the code MM55 and there's a link in the description. Okay, back to the show. So I just want to say again, I want, to th I want this to be an open discussion. So I want to throw out counter arguments that doesn't necessarily reflect the opinions here. I just want us to be able to have the conversation that many people might not feel comfortable having. Mm. There's, I've got some stats around gender and pay. So in 1997, it was 27.5% for all. Today or in 2020, sorry, 2022, it was 14.9%. So there's been an the improvement. Pay gap yeah. Between men and women. Yeah. It gets worse the higher you earn. Um, which I think is quite interesting. Um, so, you know, more skilled or higher paid men tend to be paid higher for the for that. But it has come down over that time, mm -hmm. which which is a positive. Yeah. But it's still quite significant. Yeah. There's a lot of people that deny it's even there still though. Yeah, I mean, there's just some, you could put stats in front of some people and if they don't want to believe it, they don't want to believe it. But I did a video on this um, around March time this year. So the current gender pay gap is around... Um, uh, is fifteen percent. So mm. essentially, for every one pound a man earns, and this is all workers, a woman will earn eighty five p. That's significant as well yeah. when you think about it. But I think that the biggest misconception is that, like, if you're a woman, any woman in any job mm. earning anywhere, that the man sitting next to you is earning um, like fifteen percent more than you. That's not the case. What we actually see is pretty much gender pay parity up until the age of thirty. And then at 30, the gap widens. And this is what the Institute for Fiscal Studies is called the motherhood penalty. Because as, as, as we also know, the age of a first time mum uh, for the first time is like 31 in this country. And this is the period of a woman's life where she is most likely to take time out of work and give caregiving responsibilities and so on. Um, so I think it's about, it's not entirely this, like if there was a fix for it, I'm sure we would have done that. But I think it's about reducing the burden from mums to be the caregivers of children and to give dads more of a say. Like you both got kids, right? How yeah. much time did you get to spend with your newborns when they were two weeks? Newborn? It was two weeks. And right? then you can't afford to No, and then it's like, you got, as a salesman, it's like you don't sell, you don't eat. So yeah. you get back Honestly, in. I'm lucky because I work from home, but like it's hard because I'm on a Zoom call. Well, you're and he's still just working. Like, yeah, that's he not, just that's he not wants to come on every Zoom call. He wants to bang on my mat. <laughs> I like, smash the keys. He wants to say hi to whoever, whoever's on the call. So it's hard. It's hard. And like, you're trying to talk numbers. You're trying to have a serious conversation. Mm -hmm. And the kid's like, ah, and he's like dribbling, <laughs> on, dribb, dribbling on me and like slamming the keys. And then he closes the window and I'm like, oh, sorry, yeah. one second. I can't see yeah. you. And I've got turns, to open the window. Turns again. you into a cat. Yeah. If we're saying it's not, I don't know what button it is. I can't come I promise you I'm not a cat. This yeah. is just a filter, yeah. I promise. Yeah. So let's say gender pay gap is actually a pregnant woman pay gap or there's like a bias. It's a, so it's a big chunk of yeah, it. Yeah, a big chunk of it is because of that. There's obviously prejudice in there, but like a large portion of it is this. And if we could level the playing field in terms of paternity rights and the view that the woman is the primary caregiver, that might help that. But how do you combat the fact that some women want to be the primary caregiver? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, one of the most important jobs that we do as a species is the 
birthing and the rearing of the next generation. And money is an insanely useful invention um, by by human beings. Um, and it's gotten us to where we are today, but there are some things that money simply just isn't able to value um, at the moment. So when you look at things like caregiving work, ONS um, data uh, published, I think in like 2014, um, found that if you were to tot up all of the unpaid work that is done in this country, primarily by women, it would come to 1.1 trillion or 56% wow. of all GDP. And this is all the housework, all of the looking after the children and, and, and so on. And we just don't know, our market can't capture that value, but that's, you know, if you don't raise a child right, that's something that can go enormously left, like in the economy and stuff. So we need to almost evolve the current iteration of capitalism. Yeah, my, my partner was having a conversation with me the other day and she said, in the past, we almost valued motherhood more than we do today mm -hmm. because the conversation was the man goes out and work and I'll raise the children because those are equal in this household, you know, and yes. those are two very, very hard jobs. Yeah. Where it's now, woman goes out, be a boss, get a career, but also go home and part-time do all the- Woman's got two well. jobs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's almost harder today than it was back then, you know. My partner says she's the babysitter, the cleaner, the cook, and like six other jobs. She's only talking jobs. about you as yes. well. Yes. Yeah. And like six other jobs. And she's also a, a therapist. So she's going back to work in like January. Yeah. So it's like, I don't think I could do all of that and go to work. So it's, it is quite a lot of daunting task. Yeah. And I, I think as well, because I've, I've spent some time poking around on gov.uk, looking at the maternity policies of different countries in mm -hmm. Europe. And it seems like what we've done in the UK is we have almost outsourced the quality of your maternity or paternity leave to the company that you work for. So if you work for a big company, you probably have, you know, full salary for X number of months and um, kind of all sorts of benefits there. But if you work in like a smaller company, I, I used to um, work for a charity, you may not see the same like benefits. But you get the statutory benefits. Yeah, yeah, you might, yeah. You might get um, statutory benefits. But if you look over in like Scandinavia in Sweden, women are like getting... I think it's like full or close to, close to full pay for like a year to, to have a baby. I will admit that that's something that's a lot easier to do the smaller your population is, but it just shows like what the country values. It's like, if you have a kid, the state's going to back you because that child is going to grow up and become mm -hmm. like a future taxpayer exactly. and a bunch of other things. Yeah. So because people are making decisions not to have kids because of the burdens around their home. I, I was saw, um, there was a thing on Netflix that was like, you know, why do women get paid less? Mm. And they were talking about this caregiving point and they looked at examples and they drew Iceland up as a country where there's equal paternity rights on a use it or lose it basis. Yeah. So the men are incentivized to take the time off, time off because why wouldn't you? <laughs> Stay with your baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get six months here. So they take it and then through that period, they, a lot of men realize, oh, you know what? I'll, I'll stay at home. You go back to work because you earn more, more, more than me. You're better at it. You know, your career trajectory is better, but it just doesn't seem that way here, does it? You know, in the UK, we don't- You don't hear about paternity leave in the UK. I mean, I'm, some places I'm sure they offer it, right? Yeah, but it, it'll, be, it'll be company by company. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, some companies yeah. will offer it, but yeah. you don't hear- you And even just culturally, often. even if we know that that's wrong, that's still the culture, yeah. right? Isn't it? Like the, that the man goes back and- if we flip this from the company's perspective, how do we ask companies, especially small ones, to shoulder that burden? How how, how can they do that? And so this is the point that I was making about um, like Scan the Scandinavian countries. I think the question is, if so, if, if we like stop having kids in, in two generations, there's just no more people, right? Mm -hmm. There's just squirrels and pigeons or whoever <laughs> takes over from us after that. So it's like if someone has a, a child and they have to take out time from work to raise that child and look after them in those, especially in those, I've not had a kid, but from what I um, can sense from my friends who have is that those first three to six months are just very peak and you just need as much <laughs> yeah. support as possible. Whose responsibility is it to help those families through that period of time, particularly for your first child? Is it the responsibility of the company that you work for at that period of time? Or should we say that this, there's a minimum level of support that you will get from the state as a taxpayer, as a citizen of the country? That's what I think the question is. Yeah, I think you're right. Because if we look at what a company structure exists to do, it's to maximize shareholder value. Yes. And there is no shareholder value in paying out people to have babies. No, you no. know, they're, they're incentivized to go the other way. And yeah. what you get over time is, 
well, Larry works more than Jill. Larry's here. Larry doesn't go, we, and they move up. You've got to keep the lights on. You've yeah, got to sell exactly. things. You've got to provide pro- products. You've got to provide services. But if if we just said, you know what, you're a citizen of this country, you pay tax. So when you get to this and that life milestone, we're going to back you. Yeah. I personally would pay a bit more tax if I knew that dads were getting to stay home more. Yeah. I just think that that would be a better country to live in. Yeah. Okay. Gender. Let's go from that to another absolutely hot topic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about race. So I'm about to post a video and I'm going to test out this thing that Tomain gave me on the, the podcast. It's called Sensate. And whenever I post a video, that's when I tend to get a bit anxious. So I believe you put it on, put it under my top. There's a little button here that I turn on. And then I've got an app. They've got loads of different tracks that I can pick. I'm going to go for nature because I never see the outside anymore. I just stay in this dark little room. So that sounds nice. I'm not going to lie to you. I feel a little bit weird about you watching me do this, you know, getting all zen. So if you don't mind, just give me a couple of minutes and then I'll come back to you and I'll tell you what it's like and give you some feedback. Hello. So I've just done that for 10 minutes and I feel noticeably calmer. What I'd liken it to is like having a cat on your chest vibrating while you're listening to some meditation music. One thing I'd say is I know the benefits of meditation. I've read up on it. I know that it's great for people, but I really struggle to kind of get into that space. I've never been able to just sit down and, you know, get into this Zen zone. I just sit there with my mind racing. But I found with that, within seconds, it just kind of got me into that relaxed space. If you want to try this out for yourself, then there's a link in the description. I think you get 10% off with our code, which is MM10. But yeah, I'll keep you, I'll keep testing it and I'll report back and I'll give T feedback on his device. Most minority ethnic groups continue to earn less than white British employees, according to the ONS. There are some ethnic groups that do earn more than say a white male. In 2019, the median hourly pay for those in the white ethnic group was £12.40 per hour compared to those in the ethnic minority at £12.11. So that's a pay gap of 2.3%. The pay gap was at its largest in 2014 at 8.4%. I, before we go into stats, I just can you guys give me your personal experience and your view on this? Because I obviously have no, no view on this from a personal perspective. You want to go first? Um, I do not think that my ethnicity has impacted how much I've been paid in my work life or in my business life. And I've never actually said this like outwardly before, but I even think that in my business life, it helps me because I'm working in an industry that's not full of people that look like Mm -hmm. me. And so when I'm sitting on a panel and like, I'm the only black person, like I, I understand what the people that are organizing that event are trying to do. They're trying to have a diverse- yeah. um, And there's only a handful of you in the yeah. space, whereas there's a lot of yeah. white males in and, the and, and I appreciate that too. And I never sell on the fact that I'm a, no. a black creator, a, a person talking about money. But I, I, I would say that in some senses it's helped me. But I will be honest, that 2.3% um, gap is a lot smaller than I thought it would be. Yeah. Because 100%. <laughs> Because if I think, so that's just me talking about myself, but if I just look at the people that I know, if I just think anecdotally, I would have expected that gap to be a lot higher. What about you, T? I I actually kind of echo your sentiments. Um, the only place I found that it's negatively affected my promotions and things was only because I when I worked for a Russian crypto exchange and half their meetings were in Russian. Like they'd be talking and then they suddenly switched language into Russian. So everyone that spoke Russian tended to get promoted quicker. They, you know, they're all yeah. like friends with the CEO. They're all on the inside. So I think, but that was more of a language barrier rather than like if I was Chinese or if I was like French, it wouldn't make a difference. I still don't speak Russian. Mm-hmm. So for me, I agree with you. I think it's actually benefited me. Like when I was applying for my MBA in Manchester, I knew that they've got to fill a quota of people from London, um, diversity as well. So I ticked both boxes. So mm-hmm. I, they were like, here, have a, have a, like a scholarship. Like we want you to come here. Mm-hmm. So, and, um, also in like jobs as well. But my, one of my cousin works in recruitment and his name is Shalaya, but he calls himself Alex because he says, 
knowing a recruitment, when you apply for certain jobs, they might judge you based on your name. So he always uses Alex, which is his middle name, rather than Shalaya, which is a bit more African. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So <clears throat> regarding the pay, I don't think it's made a difference. But regarding getting um, like hired for jobs, I think that can, like your name can have a- The problem is you don't know. But you don't know, that's the yeah, thing. And it's, it's not dated that yeah, you can really there's, there's, extract. There's discrimination for sure, but a lot of it is quite covert. And yeah. so you're like, did, did I that not happen? get the- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that that kind of messes you up a bit more. There's sometimes when you want it to maybe be a bit more overt, it's gonna be like, okay, fine, they're kind of discriminating against me. Yeah. It's also compulsory to note that unlike gender pay gap reporting, which has been compulsory for companies of over 250, employ- 250 employees since 2017, ethnicity pay gap reporting isn't. So the 2.3% is smaller than I thought it would be just based on my lived experience and, and, and anecdotes, but the data is the data. But when it comes to ethnicity, the biggest gaps we see are in wealth. Yes. So the Runnymede Trust did a study in 2020, which has been widely popularized, which found that um, for every one pound a white British person earns, um, like bl- a black Caribbean person earns 20p and a black African person earns 10p. I think Bangladeshis was 10p. And then Indian and Chinese ethnicities were like quite up there. They were like in the 80 to 90p range. So you see this huge disparity in wealth. This comes from lack of home ownership, um, you know, financial education levels, time in the country. Um, I, I, I don't think it's like entirely this, but like Caribbeans, most of the Caribbeans in the country have on average been here longer than most of the Africans, like arriving here in the 40s and 50s, as opposed to in the 80s and 90s. Um, So it's more time to build up your pension and stuff. And then of course, there's kind of like the discrimination aspect that we spoke of as well. So that's why in a lot of the work that I do, I try to teach people about how to not just earn the salary, but how to build your wealth, like how to increase your your net worth, because that's a Um, a big part of your financial outcomes as well. And then there's an interesting thing that happens when you either come from a culture that is more socially orientated and then you move to one which is more kind of state orientated. Um, So like I'll, I have, and probably will have to again, like give money to grandparents, uncles, aunts, you know, someone's going back home. Can you contribute some money? And stuff really yeah absolutely mm. and this will also fe- th- th- these are like the the gaps that aren't measured so you could have two people on the same salary but this person's sending money back home but this person's getting money from the bank of mum and dad yeah. and you just will never know because money is a taboo subject and, people and we be, don't talk yeah. about it and people could be sending like 80 percent 70 percent of their paycheck back to like nigeria yeah. or to another because the exchange rate is so beautiful so that when it gets there, they so can get so It's a thousand naira to one pound. Yeah. So do when we get there, we've got like wads of cash like this big, like envelopes of money. It's ridiculous. Like it's so impractical, but you so do I, feel like a baller. But yeah, it's just excessive amounts of cash. I'm at the family dinner the other day. It was my mom's 60th. I earn good money, um, but my uncle slopes off and pays for it because it's like, the kid, the, don't let the kids pay for it. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I'm like sat there going, I would have paid my way at least. <laughs> but it's like that, I, 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 they're never asking me for money. You know, they're, they're seeing it as it, it rolls downhill, mm-hmm. which again, like that has huge implications for wealth long-term, massive, doesn't it? Massive, massive. Mm. Not paying it upwards or even just the, the compounding of you going, oh, if I take a thousand pound out now, I've got to give it to my auntie or my uncle or whatever. That's money that then you can't invest. If you invest put it into the market, in, yeah, yeah, that exactly. would have, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't even considered it. This is the this is the privilege of being a six foot three white man in this country, I guess. Yeah. Like when the time I realised that racism exists was when you asked me how many times I'd been pulled over. Yeah, and I was like, "What are you on about? I've never, never been, been pulled, pulled over. over. You've never been stopped and searched. No. Crazy, right? <laughs> we need to hook you up. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would, I would, I'd be sure it'd be like, it's happening to. You. I posted about my stop. I got stopped and searched last in February 2021, and I posted about it. And but my comments and DMs, which was a bunch of black guys going like, "Yeah, it's me normal. Too. Yeah, yeah. It's casual. but he's like, I get it. it's like once it's a quarter. Too nice to get it. You drive the, similar especially cars. Especially when I was riding a bicycle, like." When I'm just growing up in my area, riding a bicycle, police would be like, did you steal this bicycle? I'm like, it's clearly my bicycle. Yeah, like, it's, it's just a Boris the- bike. Yeah. <laughs> it gets to the point where you want to put on a three-piece suit to go to Sainsbury's. Honestly, you know? But honestly. then they'll arrest you for being too, like, <laughs> for being too fancy. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, he's definitely doing something that, illegal. That, that is insane, but this is like the- But a lot of people are thinking about, I was in, I think we were coming back from a bar in Manchester. I don't know if you were there, but um, there was a girl with us and well, one of my boys. And then I was like, okay, can the girl sit in the front so that we don't get stopped because then the police are going to think, oh, it's a white chick. Like, it's cool. Mm-hmm. That's fine. And they were like, 
Why? I never thought about that. And like, they people just don't have to think about that part of life. But even though you haven't been through these things, and even though there are aspects, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you for talking about it. Oh, 100%. Thank you for creating a platform to air these conversations. The more people know, the more people are aware, then that's how stuff changes. That's how stuff gets better yeah. over time. Yeah, I realized quite quick that I am ignorant to a lot of things, especially through YouTube, because you see the comments and you're thinking, oh, that's an interesting perspective that I have absolutely no view on and things like that. I I, I was, I will say that I grow up, grew up, I grew up in inner city Birmingham. So I grew up in Aston, near Aston, Erdington. I was one of the minorities in the class as such. There wasn't many white people in my class. Or there was a, like 10 versus a class of 30. Racism didn't exist to me. Like race didn't, you know, most of my mates were Muslim or whatever. So I grew up thinking it doesn't exist in this country. Why would someone be racist? And then that conversation with Tomei and I was like, oh, you, you don't even know the racism. You don't see it, you know? So what I want to counter that with though, though, in order to be balanced is mm. how do we make sure we don't go too far the other way? That there's a load of white boys that, should be getting jobs that don't, or you no, know, well, these that, that, that is a really action. No, well, that, that is a really good point, which is that the the white working class demographic in this country is actually going through one of the hardest times as well. I feel like the most evil person in the country, and I, I, I'm like, we're, we're held up as the poster child of Especially all the wrong decisions. England you know? and America, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, yeah. And how does my son? How do I make him grow up going? You know, you should be proud of who you are. You you know, you're part of this country. You're, you'll, you'll get fair opportunity like everyone else. And we live in a society where the best man gets, the best man or woman gets the job. That's, mm -hmm. you know, how do we ensure that? I mean, I think the fact that when we're talking about the wealth gap, the fact that like most boards of directors are predominantly white males, do we know roughly how many percentage of like people are in are? Um, so hired, oh. it's twenty percent of the UK population are an ethnic, uh, ethnic minority, minority around that. Yeah, so eighty percent are white. Obviously, higher in London. I think almost forty to f almost half of London. Mm -hmm. are, um, so when you look at like boards of directors, you don't see like eighty percent of them are white and twenty percent of them are like ethnic minorities. Normally, mm -hmm. it's more like ninety five five or like ninety ten or yeah, a lot. And the same with women as well. It's not fifty fifty men and women on the boards of directors of most of these companies. Yeah, and it, even like women's companies, like you, yeah. you put people in in the positions of power and then policy will, will will change over time, won't it? I saw in this documentary that they looked at places that have don't have as big of issues with gender pay gaps. And one of them was Rwanda because of all the men had been killed. Hmm. So the women had to take the jobs. And then mm -hmm. over time, I think it's gone backwards now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but you know, policy will change if you give people a chance. I actually was reading a, um, a report from the Competition and Markets Authority and they voluntarily were stating their ethnicity pay gap data. And they said that for them specifically, it would be solved by just having more, like a more diverse ethnicities at a senior level. And that would reduce the ethnicity pay gap for them specifically. I am, so you, you asked earlier, like, is it generate, is it generational? Yeah. And I think it is. I'm super, super optimistic for like us as a country and us as, as, as a society. <laughs> oh yeah. We are, raising the smartest, most technologically advanced generation to have ever existed. I gave a Q&A in front of 100 year eights in May. And the first question was, what are we gonna do about inflation? Like wow. these people have access to, well, these kids have access to so much data on their phones. They're super connected, they get it. And I just think if we properly invest into them, if we guide them, if we put the next generation first, because like huma you want humanity to get better over time and not slide backwards. I think if we do that, then we have a bright future ahead of us. Yeah, because part of, part of the problem of me not thinking when I was younger that racism existed was that I didn't know any racists, but that speaks to like the generation around me. I don't think, I don't know. Like I think it's a lot like they say with Instagram, whatever you look for, you find people right. to reinforce your. So for me, I always love basketball. So I see loads of basketball videos and they're like, oh yeah, LeBron's the greatest. I'm like, yeah, me too. But then <laughs> if, you, if you hate LeBron, you're Messi gonna go on there and you're just gonna see everyone be like, yeah, LeBron sucks. And then the algorithm will pick up more people that believe the same thing you do. So basically if you don't see racism and you've got loads of diverse friends, you won't see it. But if you change environments and suddenly you're surrounded by if, if you are racist, you're going to find racist people. If you're not racist, you're going to find other people that aren't. You find people that kind of think the same as you, I, I find. And and like policies and rule, you know, like racism isn't, or, or any 
form of discrimination isn't always in individual people. Sometimes it's in the rules. Mm. Women can open a bank account in this country until 1975. And that still affects the perceptions of women in terms of like who looks after the money in the yeah. household and stuff. There's a generation of women still alive that didn't have bank accounts. Yeah, and, that's yeah. wild. 1975. 1975. So... And they've only been able to vote since 1918 or so something like that. So you hear this like in like so. the Middle East and you're like, oh yeah, that's so crazy. Women can't drive, women can't vote. But yeah. 1975 in England. Yeah. And we're born in the 80s, mate. Yeah. <laughs> it's just pretty soon. Yeah, I, was, I was born in 1989, the tail end. So we need to put the right environments in place, which bring out the best in people. Yeah, amazing. Speaking of environments that bring out the best in people. <laughs> that was a smooth transition. Let's talk about tax. <laughs> tax environments. So yeah. I've got some facts here around tax bans. The Institute of Financial Studies have called the recent tax ban freeze the biggest, the single biggest tax raising measure since the 1970s. And this is the idea of like fiscal drag, where if you hold tax bans where they are, everyone ends up paying more tax. So one that you, you would understand is, let's say inflation is 10% and you get a 10% pay rise, but that 10% pay rise makes you cross into a higher tax band. Yeah. You're taxed at 40% on that. So you lose 40% of it. So just to get get you up to, you're actually gone backwards. Yeah, I definitely understand that because it happened to me before, but, but I never knew that. But it affects everyone at yeah. all incomes because if you're in the middle of the tax band, you get a 10% pay rise. There should have been 10% tax-free gone up on the other end. Yeah. So it's not as pronounced there. And just to be clear, you're only taxed on the amount that goes over the threshold. The remainder still sits at the lower tax band of 20%. Mm. You're still better off. But what we're talking is the real impact after inflation. And if you're expecting a pay rise to put you back where you were six months ago, it's not because that portion is being taxed. But it's it's that idea of by holding it, you tax people more. And that has happened a lot. I mean, I think when I did the stats on my video, it was like a million, a million people or something. and Had been dragged yeah, up. Yeah, dragged into, into a higher yeah, band. Higher and higher tax bands. So yeah, they didn't increase the tax thresholds they kept them the same which yes as wages march upwards pushes more people into higher tax brackets but i'll try and be like the devil's advocate person in this you scenario um, <laughs> it's like we're trying to pay back a lot of the money that was spent during covid and stuff through increased tax revenues because as we saw last year when uh, trust and Quateng tried to cut taxes like the market went left so that freeze means that like more money, more tax receipts are, are coming in. But what they did also do at the same time, and this is just my devil's advocate point, is they did increase the pension allowance and the lifetime allowance as well. And if you are paying more in terms of tax, a very simple and legal way to avoid tax is obviously to pay more into your pension. And yeah. you can do that to the value of £60,000 per tax year. Yeah, great. Especially, you know, if you're going into the higher tax band, you can sacrifice that portion in and you're saving at the, at the higher rate that you're paying. So yeah. 40% or even additional rate is, I think the 65% efficiency you can get at the real high end. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you pay it in. But when you're talking cost of living pay rises, mm -hmm. people are like, I need that money to live, you know, and they've, they've gone a, a bit backwards. I mean, more stats here around. So... In the 1990s, no nurses and just 5 to 6% of teachers paid higher rate tax. Um, now, one in eight nurses and one in four teachers are in the higher rate tax bands. And these That's aren't- That's crazy. These aren't, they, they were striking recently. These like, aren't jobs yeah. that you associate with being higher rate yeah. taxpayers. You know, it, back in the day, being a higher rate meant something. It meant like, you know, oh, they're doing Yeah, okay. you're doing all right. Yeah. They're doing all right. Now it feels it's like- Very liquid. It feels like you need to be in that just to live now almost. Yeah. And the freeze is until 2028, isn't it? Yeah. Is there, is there a degree to which if um, we have a change of government, they could just come in and yes. like change the rules? So. Yeah. Yeah. So so Labour will backtrack on the lifetime allowance probably for right. the pension, which right. is an awful decision probably. Just to, to say what that is, it's if you go over around a million pounds, you, you would get taxed aggressively on anything in a pension when you're taking it out. But most people our age need more than a million pounds in pension because you could draw about 30 to 40k a year in income on that mm. and if you stretch out 30 years that'll be about 40k in 20 in 30 years will be about 20k today yes. so it's not a lot yeah, so, yeah, it's like yeah. Half a yeah most people when they envisage what they like to be that's that's a million to two million pound lifestyle in retirement also we had the issue with doctors now who were disincentivized to work because they were getting tax bills because of how their salary works by going backwards 
it's a whole separate topic, but they shouldn't mess with pensions because you're asking people to commit to 30, 40 years worth of savings, but you're changing the rules every 10 minutes. And like me now, I've got enough in a pension where if I did not invest another day pound in it, it will hit the allowance. So I can, oh, okay, I'll throw some more in. Oh no, I'll stop. Oh, like, do you know what I mean? It's, it, it stops me from- it Makes it really difficult to plan. plan. Yeah. yeah. All this, all these changes, all the, like sometimes, I just remember that we had three prime ministers last year. Yeah. Yeah. Just how wild that was. That is wild. If I had a kid in a school that had three headmasters in one year, <laughs> I'd, them out. I'd want a meeting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And what's happened is the pensions have become a, a, pocky, a hockey puck that, that the parties can pass around. And what Labour will probably do is go rich people who have more than a million quid in their pensions without explaining, actually, that doesn't make you rich. That's a, a just above an average income, really, you know. Um, obviously, what the Conservatives can do is try and win votes that way, because by removing those allowances and putting it up to they appeal to a demographic of 60K into pensions a year is a lot of money, right? I think at some point, the conversation is gonna have to move from, well, not, maybe not move from, but expand to, um, like from how expensive everything is and how, infl how high inflation is and how in high interest rates are to growth. Mm. Because with- Let's try that. Yeah, well, she made a decision which should have been made in like a year and a day. So mm. it just didn't work out. But it is going to have to go to growth because even if inflation returns to the target of 2%, it's like 6% odd now, that still price is going up, yeah. but just more slowly. not going backwards. Yeah. There's no deflation. So we need growth to catch up. We need like business growth and innovation. We need to make stuff and like sell it like globally. And I think that we have an enormous opportunity in this country to do that with things like clean energy and so on. You know, like you look at the US, it's like we use Microsoft com like computers, we have iPhones, we use Google every day, or we use all of Meta's platforms and stuff. Like we we could be that, mm -hmm. you know, we are a really, we're a country with a lot of potential. And I think we just need to, Obviously we can't do it overnight, but we need to like make and then sell to the rest of the world, like be known for something again. So if I give an example of, of how this country holds me back, I live in Southport, which is a Northern town, a um, hundred thousand people live there and I, I do not have high speed internet, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm a creator, right? So what I could be is I could be a very profitable business that then employs people mm -hmm. and 20 years down the line, I might be a media company. You know, who knows what I could end up being. But right now I'm throttled by the fact it takes two and a half hours to upload a video and I have to tether off my phone and drive to the nearest five. You have five, to do that now? Yeah, 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 right now. We, and, and the plan is not to install the high-speed line until 2028 or something, like right at the end. So, you know, I, I, went to, I went to Iceland and went in a remote log cabin where it was like the toilet was outside and the internet was faster than my house. <laughs> <laughs> it's like how, so we talk about supporting businesses and that this is like, how, how does everyone in the UK not have rapid internet? Similar to what we said in the gender part of the conversation, we were like, whose job is it to almost like back the parents yeah. are having kids? If you run, if, if we just pretend that the UK isn't a country full of 70 million people and that it's just like a remote island with a hundred people on it, the people who are in charge of running the island what would you expect them to look after? Well, I think they you probably want them to keep the lights on, make sure that the transport works, make sure that the bins are taken out, make sure that the healthcare services works, cover almost the bottom two uh, levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs so that the people, the citizens can get to work yeah. and upload their content and be seen to in the hospital. And I feel like we need to almost have like a group huddle and be like, how are we divvying up the jobs? Like whose job is it to do? Yeah. Certain things. And with, with, with more tax, you would hope that these systems improve, but they're not. So is the answer more taxation or is it, we need to look at it and go, are you spending this money efficiently? This is just my view. This is just my view. And I'm saying this as someone who only really became politically engaged during COVID. I didn't really yeah, follow politics yeah, yeah. that much prior to that. People start to see that it really does impact. Them. Yeah. 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 That was most of the prime ministers in this country since the start of the 20th century were conservative. They've been in charge for like a decade and a half nearly. And they provide, they, they inherited an economy which was at the tail end of the financial crisis. They've been in charge through um, like Brexit. They've been in charge through like the COVID pandemic and the now cost of living crisis. 
we do not have a culture in this country where people can go, we made a mistake, we're going to fix it because you'll be crucified by the media. You'll be crucified by the people in the YouTube comments and stuff. So they look back to 2010. They can't even like admit that stuff has gone wrong. Swati Dingra um, of the MPC said that Brexit has... Um, has contributed to the economic pain yeah. that we're feeling now, that it devalued the pound, that it made us more difficult to trade with, that it's meant that we're being paid less. But no one in the government can say that, yeah. can even possibly admit to that as a very reasonable consequence yeah. to leaving the European Union. They can't even do that because yeah. if you admit that you're wrong, you'll be, you'll be slaughtered. So yeah. I think we need to put them on the bench. I'm sure they'll be back. And just let someone else come in, like even if it's for a term. It's been too long. There are people... 2010 precedes the invention of tinder any of the episodes of game of threat like it's a long time ago yeah. like that's when the first ipad came out just let someone else wow. yeah let someone else have a drive come in yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah just for four or five years that's that's my point of view yeah yeah well, i mean the polls would say that that's that's probably going to happen but yeah. i do think they've got some tricks up their sleeves before then oh, we're going to we're we're see, we're see some dirty politics <laughs> leading up to it There's yeah and i say that as like a kind of a political person that's just my common sense view of like when you have someone that's been in power for too long it just gets a bit yeah there's too much almost history there well i think we're near time mm. the one thing i've learned about this conversation is uh the points around, you know, the thing I really take away is having that conversation with an employer and saying, you know, if I do this, will you do that? I think having those conversations, you get like a cause and effect kind of relationship rather than just sitting there hoping that you'll be promoted. I thought that was really valuable. Mm -hmm. I'm also sweating because of the conversations we had around <laughs> race. Uh, you, you, ha you handled those with grace and aplomb. Yeah, 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 nice, yeah. nice. A little bit of elegance there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I've sort of taken away from this conversation is just the our monetary system needs to evolve to be able to capture value from the less tangible stuff. So if I make a, a million one pound hats and I manage to sell all of them, I'll make a million quid. But if I raise a literal human being who like grows up to just, you know, cure cancer or something, it's just like, yeah, well done. Yeah, what's what, it's a big here's, cost? A here's, big cost on you. Here's a here's a card. How how much is like Mrs. Musk's parenting worth? Yes. Do you know what I mean? Like, how much would you pay her to be yeah. like? What are your what are your parenting tips? And you and you know you have people like Warren Buffett, and this is why this is why I really like the man because he's very like self aware. He credits a lot of his wealth to winning the ovarian lottery. He's yeah. like, I was born as a white man in the thirties in the States. I have two sisters that were just as intelligent as me, but because of the circumstances to which I was born, which I had no control over, that was like a really big factor in then the trajectory over the course of, of my life. So I think we need to value human life a bit more and we need to decide like whose job it, it is to like back people who are having kids and like raising the next generation. I think that'll solve a lot. You both legends. Thank you for having the conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Amen. If you enjoyed today's episode, you'll love this one. And if you want a summary of everything that we've discussed, then sign up to our newsletter in the, in the description below. And don't forget to subscribe here.